We had over a thousand RSVPs thanks to Jack's ability to promote. So thanks and welcome on behalf of Sahil and the team at Gumroad, Jack. Thanks for having me, mate. I appreciate it. So let me introduce you, Jack, if that's cool. Uh, you and I have been talking for about a year now. Uh, I discovered you on Twitter. You have a crystal clear voice, a very compelling persona, an ability to communicate. I was impressed by your output and your message and your philosophy. I tried to reverse engineer it for a period of time, downloaded 3,000 of your tweets and sort of resolved them together into your 22 big ideas. So hopefully we'll talk about a few of those today. Um, but for the folks that might not be completely familiar with who you are um, and what you're building, uh, let me just briefly describe it. And then I know you're going to be talking a little bit about that and showing us in detail uh, what you've built and where you're going. Um, Jack is the founder and CEO of Visualize Value. Um, that brand is the outgrowth of a 10 year career um, in corporate advertising, um, which was itself on top of uh, some freelance work and other things. Um, I like to say that Jack basically has worked himself out of a job and now he's unemployed and uh, living in Nashville with his wife, Celia, who he's building visualized value with. It's a two person, I call it, an, uh, it's typically called a one person internet business, but we all know that there is a genius behind the scenes with Jack and Celia. 100%, yeah. <clears throat> Um, I know you're going to be talking a, a bit about your corporate advertising gig and some of your clients, so I won't list those here. Um, what I will say, though, is that you are excellent at articulating the value prop of specialized businesses. And that's sort of what you started to hone in on at the end of your the latter stages as you built that specific knowledge in your corporate advertising career. And the way you talk about it often is that you are um, pioneering, or at least I say you're pioneering, um, visual engineering um, as a discipline. And uh, hopefully we'll get into that on this conversation. Um, and by that, I mean, you're making the intellectual capital of organizations, businesses, and people tangible. Um, and you can do that, obviously, in words, but um, you've iconically done it with the Visualized Value brand, both on Instagram and on Twitter, um, with these very iconic, recognizable, highly recognizable uh, images all over uh, Twitter. Um, you talk about visualized value as a mental wealth service. And I think uh, for many of us who follow you, that's certainly the case. Um, you've not only um, sort of uh, joined your, your curiosity and in, in philosophy with your competence in design and branding and marketing, and together it's a um, it's a joy, I think, for a lot of us to see the output um, and to be inspired by it. So um, the last thing I'll say is, uh, is by way of introduction before I turn it over to you for your presentation is um, you offer in Visualize Value some services. Obviously, on the high end, there's consulting services, um, but then there's productized services. Uh, these trust folk, the trust profile sprints that you do with some clients. Um, but what you've been driving toward all along is these products, uh, obviously the visualized value community, which I'm a part of in full disclosure. Um, and then the product of um, build once, sell twice, which is the topic we have uh, here today. Uh, I call it the field manual for earning a living in the new economy and uh, how to visualize value, another uh, Gumroad course. So those are two highly successful Gumroad courses You've made um, well into the multiple six figures just in the last several months uh, from that process um, and those, those two products in particular. And you have a host of other products uh, on Gumroad and that you sell directly from your website. So Jack, welcome again to Gumroad Creator Studio. Really great to have you here. And why don't I turn the, turn the floor over to you? Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I, uh, I have about, I think about 15 minutes worth of... Uh presentation here chuck a few visuals in and uh the idea that i want to unpack on this call is this idea of building something once and selling it twice which essentially you know, a platform like gumroad is the infrastructure to make an idea like this possible at scale so uh, i want to talk a little bit about how i discovered this idea originally how i translated the experiences i've had 
uh, in a way that made this possible for me, hopefully as a catalyst for other people to sort of put that over their experience as a little bit of a, um, an X-ray lens and, and figure out how to, how to you know, move in a similar direction. So build once, sell twice is an idea, uh, full, full credit where credit's due, pay homage to Naval. I discovered this uh, tweet storm, how to get rich without getting lucky. I have a feeling most of the people watching this webinar will be familiar with this, but if you're not required reading. Um, so I, I read that a couple of years ago when I was uh, in the middle of a crazy service business, um, you know, really burned out, losing my mind, um, making an all right living, but just the lifestyle was just completely brutal. And the idea that really stuck with me from the Val Sweet Storm here is this idea of earning with your mind and not your time. So it takes a really long time for this idea to, I think everybody understands it in theory, but until you, you, you kind of feel it happen once, that's when it really clicks in. So uh, this is a graphic I made as a result of reading that, um, reading that tweet storm and actually starting to discover these concepts that changed the way I thought about work. And 18 months or so later, ha having um, implemented a lot of the advice that he put together in that tweet storm, I was fortunate enough to catch his eye and, and kind of come full circle here and have the, the journey I articulated be amplified by Naval himself. So I thought that was a nice little Easter egg to open this up with. Um, but that's all well and good. How did, how did that happen from, you know, from scratch to, to where we are today? So to, to unpack this idea of building once and selling twice, there's, you know, just an enormous portion of businesses operate this way, right? If you're, um, you sell furniture, you build something and you sell it. If you sell, um, food, you grow it and you sell it. Uh, the, even if you sell time as a employee to a business, you're essentially, you have eight hours a day. There's a price on that time and you sell it to a business every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and the, that paradigm doesn't shift until you build something that you can sell twice and what Gumroad and digital products and leverage as a concept in general allows you to do is to build something once and sell it twice, which is pictured on the right hand side of the screen here. So this is essentially the transition that I'm, I'm going to be describing in the next few slides. So how does that really break down? It's uh, in the context of something like a Gumroad, which is a tool for you to productize your experience, you know, build something that can educate, entertain, enable somebody else to do something. The, uh, the task you have is to put that experience into a product that can be built once and sold twice. And that happens for me, at least happens over this, this, um, there's a, there's a sequence to this, right. And, and you can by all means skip some of these steps, but I think the, the way in which this is sequenced has a huge effect on the value of the product that lies at the end of the journey. So the way I see it, the first component of this process is building a skill that is eventually worth buying essentially. So as Justin mentioned, my 10 year career began as a graphic designer. So I was irrationally um, creating this, this is a dribble page. If you're familiar with graphic design, you know what this is, but essentially a, a portfolio of work that, wasn't commissioned. It was just, I just love doing it. So I just make this, these made up products, these made up um, apps, posters, anything that could be visualized. I was in car dashboards. I would just mess around with and, and post them up there. And originally that's um, you know, how you get a job in the graphic design world. You go into an interview, you show your portfolio. I can do this, this, and this. Okay. We'll give you a job. We'll pay you X and um, the next year we'll give you a 2% pay rise, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, not anything new. This is you building skills and you know demonstrating you have those skills to would be employers or clients. The second piece of that is really how you apply those skills. So there's a lot of people that have incredible design skills, but the real um, relationship that you need to study is the you know how much the market values the skills that you have. So uh, over the course of ten years, I spent 
I probably had nine, 10 jobs, moved around agencies, like big, big um, digital consulting shops with 13,000 employees all the way down to like five person design studios uh, that had like two little boutique clients. And I think what that exposed me to is how you can use design to solve problems, how you can communicate really complex things to people who um, have very little time to understand. Uh, and just like communication was really the game, right? Whether you're communicating internally uh, with stakeholders or would be clients, or you're building advertising materials to commu communicate the benefit of a product to an eventual customer. So study communication in the context of this commercial environment, I think played a big part in the skills that I built that were eventually um, available to productize. So the next piece of this process is specialization. So you have these skills, you go through the process of applying them in all these different contexts, but you're still like banging up against this uh, time barrier and you don't have the level of specialization that even increases the value of your time. So if you're moving from, let's say you're shooting videos for a donut company and then the next day you're designing an application for a logistics firm. So you have, you're not really accruing this reputation and this asset, this ability to do this very pointed thing that the market recognizes you for. You're just a graphic designer. So specialization is the next stage of the journey. And really where that happened for, uh, for visualized value as a business was let's start to really restrict the type of work we're doing so we can charge more and have way less friction in the delivery process. So um, if we start to position ourselves as this business that can visually articulate complicated ideas, we're going to completely thin, um, we're going to uh, thin out the types of people that are going to be applying to work with us and uh, create demand rather than just responding to demand. So that idea was really, um, really strengthened by this like creative habit of visualizing these concepts. So whether that was something learned uh, in these corporate settings where you're trying to articulate the size of a market or, uh, the way a product solves a particular problem or where a company is positioned in uh, relation to another company. There's all these um, visual devices you can use to help people understand things more quickly and make them more memorable. So that was a specialization. Uh, the route I went down on the service side was this is the only type of work I'm going to sell my time to do. And that. Um, on the front end was really uh there was this um little habit of of visualizing ideas uh that are just universally useful so if you're a business owner and you want this process uh for your business the way i was getting the attention of these people was visualizing ideas that are just universally useful so this was it began as a lead magnet for a service business so um i think you know, retroactively, you can always kind of identify these things that were necessary in hindsight. Um, and then these uh, little adjustments to the process that, that you make along the way to just make the delivery of that stuff more efficient. So built an audience with, um, with this process of visualizing ideas. And originally it was, it would bring us a lot of great service clients and then eventually started to recognize the opportunity for, um, consumer products or helping people learn this skill. So that's where productization comes in. And that was essentially um, the first product was uh, moving from this service that we were applying. Uh, it was, it was specialized to some degree. So, you know, only a certain type of deliverables. We work in keynote, we build these visual stories, but there's still an organic component to every single process. You're on the phone, you're spending, hours with like getting the knowledge from them and product does not have that same limitation. You can build a great product, zero cost of replication, um, build it once, sell it twice. So the first product was this, um, how to visualize value as a, uh, as a curriculum. So what are the ideas, the principles that underlie this process of 
taking an idea and making it visual. And this is, uh, I think, 35, 40 lesson curriculum that takes you from, you know, I've never used a design program in my life to I have a working understanding of how to use this software and how to identify an idea and the visual components of an idea and how to ultimately visualize it. So sold that for three months or so. It's still for sale, obviously, but a, a really uh, intense process of selling it for three months and then learned a lot about essentially the story that I'm telling now. And that presents another opportunity for a product. So build once, sell twice as a philosophy, as a set of guiding principles as a number of tactics that um, you can use in your marketing to sell knowledge products that becomes another product so that was the second product I started selling on gumroad and essentially this is the transition um not complete but it's uh you know you take those four slices and this is really the story um, compiled into products that you know are sitting on gumroad at this point and there are resources uh, lying around the internet like this very video we're recording that somebody uh, comes across this idea and they're interested in learning how to do it and that drives them towards that product page and ultimately um, over time converts people and uh, brings you customers so essentially um, this was all built organically so I want to talk a little bit about the process of actually uh, getting people to notice what you're doing. And of course, I've referred a couple of slides ago to the Instagram and the Twitter profiles of Visualize Value. That really was a front end asset that would just garner a lot of attention. But the same principle applies whether or not you're doing something visually or not. It's publishing work that really demonstrates your ability to uh, do something, describe something a certain way, analyze the situation, et cetera, et cetera. Depending on the product, that's always going to be different, of course. But um, this framework doesn't really change. It's the, your ability to articulate a problem or your ability to create something that can hold attention, publish it on a platform that has this enormous distribution, and then funnel that traffic towards a product page. It's really as simple as that. Uh, to speak a little bit more about building in public, this entire journey is really a, um, an opportunity to create uh, content at every, um, every sort of waking moment, every iteration you make to your product, every time you come across a new idea that informs the way you work, you can publish something speaking about how it informed the way you work, uh, even going transparently into the tactics you are implementing to sell products creates content that ultimately sells more products so it's really this like loop of transparency and proof and talking with the people who are consuming your product getting feedback from them and understanding what they're using it for and how it's been helpful to them that's all catalyst for more content that ultimately drives more traffic to the products and there's a, this is a slide from the course itself. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here, but essentially this overwhelming amount of value you provide for free. And then on occasion, you just make these asks of, hey, if you want to look into this in more detail, come and uh, you know, buy this product and study the curriculum. It's not necessary, but you know, move the free line. I think that's Ramit Sethi. So put out a ton and ton of value and um, you will build up this well of reciprocity and trust that ultimately converts to sales. So this is a, this is a example of the first half of the year this year. So you have this service business that is succeeding, but there's this really fluctuating crazy revenue um, pattern because you have a limited amount of time. Some clients move slower than others. It's really difficult to, um, predict some of the hours that need to be spent solving certain problems. So while you can refine the service mix and get it dialed in um, probably better than I have, honestly, the product scenario is really entirely dependent on your ability to promote. If the product is built, then you're spending your time selling, marketing, getting better at that skill. And ultimately you have no ceiling to the revenue you can generate. It's, um, it's just completely down to your ability to market effectively and put value out and create great content, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a much more, in my view anyway, it's a much more 
rewarding and gamified process because you're getting that feedback and you're spending 30, 40 hours a week doing the same thing you were doing the week before. So I was going to end the uh, presentation there, but obviously there's a, a ton that goes into this that I think is important to bring up, speak to, like uh, explore. There are obviously a ton of behind the scenes inputs here. There's all these like weird coincidences and situations you found yourself in 10 years ago that you didn't know would be influencing this journey but now you know play a big role in how you think and how you structure products etc cetera, etc cetera. so this idea of effort and patience being a component of this journey is very important to me that i don't gloss over that fact when presenting this stuff because i went through that same journey and it's like any natural process right the first day you're in the gym you're going to be weak the bars are going to cross you but 10,000 reps in you're going to look different you're going to feel different you're going to be more capable etc cetera, etc cetera. it's all a game of repetition anybody who tells you any different is you know selling you something that's probably not going to work so this not applied to a biological process twitter is a great platform and i imagine a lot of you, a lot of you watching this uh frequent um twitter participants but this idea of really focusing on these networks where you can distribute your ideas and use them for distribution of attention to your products if you really focus on that in in the course of a year here i went from you know not taking twitter seriously at all not even really understanding what it was i think i set up an account when i was in high school and went back to it eight years later and then took it seriously for a year and you can see here 24 tweets in March 2019 with 6,000 impressions up to 700 tweets in uh, the following March with 5 million impressions. And uh, that process of building in public and talking about the process of figuring out how to take knowledge and productize it is largely um, responsible for that growth in reach. Uh, and then the final point I wanted to make is really um, the one of the advantages I think I had during this process is I had this service business and this skill set that under underlies the 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 um, knowledge I was productizing. So I had this ability to um, benefit from the content that was going out even a year ago right so I, I published something and if it got me one service client over the course of a month it was worth it so having those um having some having some benefit tied to the publishing i think is really important early on uh there's definitely if we think back to the four stage uh ramp as it were earlier in the presentation there's definitely a tendency, at least my observations kind of inform me that people try to get to the, the last slice before they've gone through one, two, and three. Um, so there's something to think about here where that content you're putting out is building your body of work, regardless of whether or not it's being consumed. It's bringing you smaller opportunities. It's getting you connected to uh, the right kinds of people. There's really no downside to doing what you're already doing, but doing it in public. And this is uh, uh, one of my favorite concepts, this idea of compound interest only kicks in meaningfully after the majority of people have given up on it. So I've seen this to be true in, in the work that we've done where you hit these kind of milestones and there's really a huge benefit to the network effects of building on these public platforms that can just, um, that can aggregate attention like it's, it's kind of hard to comprehend how uh how many people you can reach like i don't know how many people are on this webinar right now 270 people here right now it's just kind of a phenomenal opportunity we have to continue to put our work out there and use it to build a network of people that trust us and value what we do and um if you are doing something valuable then this graph will eventually play out as it looks.
Cool. I just wanted to end with um, a, uh, a plug here. If anybody wants to go into more detail on this, then th there's an entire curriculum and I uh, put a little um, discount on there for anyone watching this. So you can hit up gumroad.com slash visualize value and whack that in and uh, $50 off. So thanks everyone for listening. Uh, Justin, let's get into it. Well, thank you for that presentation and uh, leaves us with a, a good chunk of time here to have a conversation about it. Um, had a couple of thoughts as you were presenting. First of all, I think um, I, I used to be a speech writer and uh, I watch as a result of that, you become a very discerning listener and um, listening to presentations is a highly lossy medium. Um, the transmission loss is very high. So um, I, uh, you and I have talked in the previous um, few months about that. Uh, what, you're, what you just described are basically the foundational concepts of how to productize yourself, how to build your reputation on the internet and so forth. Um, and once you see those concepts presented as you just did, you can't really unsee them. It sticks with you. But uh, as you and I have talked about, you need to really drill them into your head over and over and over again, and then really start to experience it firsthand rather than just having it as an abstract concept. So I would just um, you know, encourage anyone listening to not only maybe watch that presentation again or just continue to familiarize yourselves um, with these concepts, but then try to actually do it. Um, you know, Try to put them into practice because that's what you really um, need to do in order to really internalize them. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is um, give our audience um, a little bit of a window into who you are as a person, get inside your head a little bit, see what makes you tick. I've got a couple of themes for us to talk about. Um, one of the things I want to start with is content creation. And one of my favorite questions for folks is, um, how's your rhythm? How's your rhythm in life? Um, it's an open-ended question that people can take wherever they want but let me narrow it down for you. Um, and this is a, a question that uh, others ask. Um, I wanna ask about your production function, how it is, um, give, us, give us a sense of how you produce the volume and the quality of the content that you produce on a daily basis. Um, and so I would just join together this idea of your daily rhythm, um, your rhythm as a person and your production function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, again, hindsight plays a great role in it. I think the, the one concept that I explore a lot of in uh, the course itself and in public is this idea of restriction or restraint. So uh, on the visual side, the production function of visualized value, just to speak to the like, very tangible side of production is making a single decision that can eliminate a thousand decisions. I think a lot of writers, creators, everybody who produces tangible creative output, um, the blank page is super intimidating for a lot of people. Uh, so on the visualized value side, that's definitely been a huge, um, a huge weight off of, uh, a huge weight off of my mind. And we talked about this before, Justin, it's like, if the, if the constraint exists, then you're the bottleneck, right? Your ability to think uh, within those constraints becomes the bottleneck. So it's kind of this, this, um, these constraints make you more creative, not less creative. I think if you, particularly if you're a designer or, you know, a writer is the same, it's like you have this vocabulary, but what, like, you could hit a blank page and write about anything any day, but visualized value gives me those constraints to, is this one, is this idea useful at a, at a massive scale? And two, how can I communicate it with these very, very few um, tools that I have available to me? So geometric shape and uh, a single typeface cuts out a ton of decisions. On the like inspiration side of things, I think it really comes from putting your work into practice. I don't think any of this stuff would be possible out um, having done some of the hard yards in the situations that suck, you know? Like, how do I stop doing this thing that's really like 
Um, the way I'm thinking about this must be wrong because I know there are people that aren't working as hard as me and are getting better results than I am. Why is that? Can I unpack like the difference between their situation and my situation? And it's like, it's brutal. It takes years and years to do that. But the that's, I think it's kind of an unfair advantage is when you start to see the new ways of thinking, it gives you like, this gasoline to talk more about why that works. So like you really are stuck under this ceiling until you like being introduced to that tweet storm by Naval was one of those moments for me it was like, Oh man, like it's a, a wall that's broken in my mind there. I was like, how can I apply that then as I'm applying those principles, what is that teaching me about what I was doing wrong? How I used to think it's like just trying to be super objective about, what I'm learning and how I'm individually processing these new um, paradigms that I, another thing, like I'm rambling a little bit here, but another thing is I didn't really, I don't really seek out like 20, 30 ideas at a time. It was like, this is one thing I've read this, this one tweet. So I'm like, I don't need to read another book for five years, 10 years until I crack this right. Like in, in theory, there's enough information here for me to take this idea, take this concept, run with it and really understand where my limitations are, um, how this relates to what I'm doing, uh, what I didn't see that was already there. Like, um, there's just, uh, there's just, um, some benefit to like the input being super narrow creates like a, a ton of freedom in the output. Um, it's a it's a weird paradigm and maybe i'm not explaining that very articulately but um that's how i've experienced it is like find an idea that you really want to implement and write about how you're implementing it and where the you know where the idea is falling short of your actual um experience in real time so that's been a huge part of it for me let me uh, follow up with a question um, about writing. Uh, people, I think, are tempted to ask you a lot about design, and I don't. I want to go in the opposite direction. Um, obviously, you have highly recognizable design work um, in your brand, if you will, and, and Instagram, uh, which is a natural fit. Um, but the thing that I think is most impressive is not your ability to communicate visually, but to communicate generally. Um, and I think clarity of communication uh, is, exp I think you're just as um, recognizable in the axiomatic aspects of your tweeting as you are in the visuals. Um, so mm -hmm. you, you once said to me, um, I often think when I tweet about what my most ardent critic would say about how I am conveying this message. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of another retroactive observation, I think. And Twitter is like an environment, I think, that I'm not a very confrontational person either. So I, I'm not trying to put stuff out there to provoke some crazy argument. It's like, do I genuinely believe this idea to be true? And if I didn't, what would be my first criticism? Or what experience would I lack that would make me uh, not believe in this thing. So I think it's almost trying to run it through this filter of objectivity or uh, trying to strip out a lot of the, I mean, there's a lot of like accusatory tone or there's a like, I think the, the, the ability to run a statement through a lot of different experiences as a like stress test too is an interesting component of that so it's kind of like I, I think David Perel tweeted this the other day about Plato it's like you shouldn't like write or think about philosophy until you're at least 30 years old because you don't have enough experience with which to like um, stress test the ideas that you're um, trying to evaluate and I think that has a lot to do with it too it's like accidental luck whatever you want to call it it's like i got i went through a lot of different 
working environment, six months in, nine months there, got bored of that, got bored of, got bored of that. It's like something's going to change or, um, you know, I'm just in the wrong version of this thing. But what you end up realizing, it's like, no, this is like the set of beliefs that I have that aren't aligning with all of these environments I've been placed in. And I think the more of that, the more proof you have for what you believe works, especially when you start to get results in, you know, if your business is a, uh, like a manifestation of those beliefs, or it's like a, you know, a, a working, living um, iteration of what you believe, then your confidence increases that, you know, there's, there's not much more validation you can get than somebody like putting their credit card into a checkout form. And then those ideas that have driven the creation of that thing are get reinforced. And it's just this feedback loop that makes you a, a better writer. I think um, there's a ton of examples of, of this on Twitter. And I think a lot about this. It's like, why are people like Naval and Sahil, why are they great writers? It's like, because they've been around a lot of different situations, a lot of different people tried to build businesses and failed and had com like difficult conversations with a lot of people. So your like experience of a consistent truth or these themes that start to emerge, just give you these insights. I think that um, resonate with a lot of people because you're um, validating them through a lot of different lenses and experiences. If, if somebody who's 70 years old agrees with, you know, some maxim that you write, it's like, you know what, probably uh, it's a stronger idea, right? The, the Nassim Taleb, Lindy principle, like your, your great grandma's um, like old wives tales or sayings that are really like profoundly true are that way because they've been tested through generations and generations. I think those things have had a lot of critics over the years and they've survived the test of time. So if you can take some of that and apply that to your own writing, I think it can't hurt. Yeah, I used to um, write for a senior official and he, he what I discovered is basically um, writing for him at least and what I've tried to do in my life is um, treat it as a process of discovery by deletion. Um, mm. The best writers seem to not care what words they're putting in, but rather what words they're taking out. And it seems like what you're good at is taking out the like unavoidable or the avoidable qualifiers, escape clauses, sugar right. coating. You're not parsing it. You're simply declaring it, that sort of a thing. Um, yeah, some, but, one of my good friends told me um, never, uh, you remember your teacher used to say, don't write I think in front of your uh, words. It's like, we know what you think. It's your name's on the front of the paper. But <laughs> there is something interesting about that too, because you're making this declarative statement and it is like, it does have this like air of like arrogance to it almost. It's like, I, I am declaring this to be true. But um, I think, you know, that's all we've been doing for centuries, millennia at this point, right? Let me talk about uh, concepts of, and, and you know what, before I talk about another couple of concepts, which I'm keen to talk about uh, with you, let me take a question um, from our chat here. Um, a gentleman by the name of Connor Fowler asked, Jack, if you had to start all over again from scratch, what's the first thing you'd do or what's the first thing you'd build? I think, I mean, knowing what I know now, I think I would just have, just collected more experience, just like poke my nose into more stuff when I was uh, an early employee at some of my first gigs. One of the ideas, again, that I've like rationalized in hindsight is as soon as I got to a level within a working environment where I was exposed to the economics of the business, it was like six, seven positions in where it's like you're trusted to like see the invoice and understand how much your time is being built out for and stuff like that. I was like, ding, light bulb went off. I was like, okay, if this is a product we're selling and I'm getting this cut of it, and it was an arrogant realization at the time, they have, you know, I have an opportunity here. If I can take something as good or better than this to market and I have good relationships, then I can support myself. So the first thing I would build is like, a profitable, uh, and this is based on my experience, a profitable service business that allowed me to 
uh, hone in a skill set that I could ultimately like build a reputation around and scale my income with. I, I tweeted something the other day about the Rouse pasta sauce. I don't know if you saw that <laughs> uh, tweet, but there's this this little uh, restaurant like 114th Street on Manhattan, Rouse. It's like two cousins, two Italian cousins, amazing little Italian restaurant. And they, you know, obviously started that because they love uh, making food and serving food to people you know, 15 years later, 20 years later, maybe longer than that, there's an opportunity for product because they built this incredible reputation and skill set. And I think that that is super hard now. Like I empathize with people who are starting this journey now because I didn't have the same level of distraction when I was getting started. Like I had a Blackberry for the first five years of my career. I don't even know if Twitter existed when I started working. So it was like, I was head down in the trenches learning these skills that uh, yeah, it was uh, some days it's like, this sucks. I don't want to do this, but um, it's really interesting to look back on that and be like, could I have skipped some of that stuff? Could I got there faster without like another two years in this scenario and be completely frank? I don't know if I could have. So uh, I think another great concept, Steve Jobs, is like you don't really know until you look back how all these experiences fit together. So if I was younger, I'd be like, if I could get paid, to learn skills and be introduced to situations that I know are going to like give me a foundation of knowledge and allow me to attack problems later in life and have an intimate understanding of them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like over engineering it when I'm just getting started out. Um, hopefully that answers your question, but that's, uh, I think about it a lot and I don't think there's a clean, clear answer. The one thing I would say is everything I talked about, about building in public and making tangible examples of your work, that's definitely advice that applies regardless. You know, if you can turn the things you're interested in into tangible examples of like output, then uh, that's a huge hedge against you know, losing a job or whatever else circumstance comes up down the line. The ability to just slowly build up that reputation just takes a long time. I'm going to um, echo back to you um, a couple of concepts that you've articulated in one-liners, um, and I'm going to try to smash them together, see what comes out. Um, the first right. has to do with permission, and you've written, um, you don't need permission to prove yourself. And then the second has to do with failure. Um, if you're scared to start that thing because you might fail, here's a reminder, you're already failing. So if you could reflect a little bit on permission and failure, um, I'll, uh, I'll have the opportunity to pick a few questions um, while, you, while you reflect on those concepts and how they interrelate. Yeah, sure. I think permission is, is like a fascinating one. And I think, again, the design industry or the process of becoming a designer is really where I became aware of this idea of not needing permission to create something that really um, resonates. So if you have a skill set, um, there was this one great case study years ago, Dribble, I think was this design platform that I mentioned earlier on. The young UI designer was like, I don't like the Facebook interface. I'm going to redesign Facebook. So no permission, didn't call up Mark Zuckerberg and go, hey, man, can I uh, change the UI of Facebook? Because you're not going to get Mark Zuckerberg on the phone, right? At any stage of Facebook's uh, journey. So he's like, I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to publish it and I'll put it on Dribble. And, you know, worst case scenario, I will have spent two hours to add a piece of work to my portfolio that, I can go and take to a job interview and say, hey, here's what I would do. And, um, you know, I have enough of a, uh, enough of an, a desire to change something that I went out of my way to do this, right? Or I have enough of an idea that I wanted to put, make it real. Um, that idea of building a portfolio of work without permission from, you know, whoever you're doing it for now is an even bigger opportunity because you can just, do a little at symbol and, and type their name in and reach them. So in the same way, there's really no downside. The one uh, 
if it doesn't result in, in a relationship with them, it adds a piece of work to your portfolio that demonstrates what you can do to somebody else. If it does get you in touch with them, then all the better. But uh, that's how a lot of the early visualized value um, traction came about is like these ideas that I really valued from thinkers and authors that had helped me sort of shape my worldview a little bit. I was like, let me give a little bit back and, and make that stuff real for them and tag them, you know, not, wasn't a frequent endorsement it's like you could probably point back to two or three instances of people um retweeting that or liking it and just exposing it to a couple hundred extra people and the snowball effect continues um but yeah that doing your work in public on open network like twitter is just an in incredibly powerful way to connect with people and there's there's wrong ways to do it of course but if you want to talk about failure, I don't think, um, I don't think failure is, can be quantified in the same way. If you're producing something that's increasing your skill set, right? It's just like looking at it a different way. It's like, is failure the inability to produce this moonshot outcome that you had in mind? Not really. It's like, I'm a failure right now. Like we all are in some way, shape or form, right? It's like, I have no, um, I have no real way to measure that. It's like, I'm, every time I put something out and it doesn't resonate, it's like, oh, I learned something from that. Every time I write something that nobody wants to read, it's like, okay, something was wrong with it. Like it's, it is a weird, I think, societal construct in a lot of ways, like being a being born around people that you're, trying to impress just because you have some proximity relationship to them is a really hard way for people to break out of that too. I would say the internet changes that as well. It's like, it allows you to build relationships with people who care about the same things you care about. And then that really changes the context of failure, right? You have, I think you have to think about why do you care about failing? And more often than not, it's because the way somebody you have in your mind is going to perceive it. And then the task becomes like cutting that person out of the logic loop required, right? If, if, this, if these are the things that you need to do to get to where you need to go, who are the people that are in your way, whether they're actually in your way or just mentally in your way, just move them out of the way. Let me take a couple of questions um, from our audience. Uh, there's uh, a question I think I would be remiss in not relaying to you, um, especially for those who aren't um, members of the Visualize Value community that you've been building. Um, the question is, is from an anonymous attendee, but uh, hi, Jack, where do you see Visualize Value in five years? Um, let me give some context to that question. Um, Jack stunned the Twitter universe about two or three weeks ago by um, simply tweeting out that he had acquired for lack of a better word, the the handle um, five letters long at value on Twitter, um, which I think was a harbinger of something to come. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, one of the really cool things about this process is having having uh, spent time identifying the ideas that have really helped me break out of like bad patterns or bad situations. Like if I was in the working this service business thing and just having a rough go of it and just could not see my way around it until I was introduced to a this certain set of ideas in this certain order that like you said, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So even if you're in that situation, you're like, okay, now I understand why I'm doing this. And eventually, I'm going to be able to apply these lessons and I'm going to be able to break out of this paradigm that I'm currently in. So in publishing all of those ideas over the last two years, I've got messages from a lot of people that have been like, and this is like, this is just, every time I hear this, it blows my mind. It's like this page really changed the way I think, or it's like I approach this situation differently now because of this one visual I saw from you three months ago, or, um, you know, I, I've been able to, dial down some like anxious experience I have whenever I'm dealing with X because, you know, 
I read these five Marcus Aurelius quotes that now I've seen and visualized, they really resonate with me on a different level. So it's like, okay, there's something bigger here than teaching people how to be graphic designers or how to visualize an idea, right? There's not, not everybody wants to do that. Not everybody needs to do that. Not everybody has the time or like, that's just not, um, that's not the work reaching the most people it can reach in the most valuable way. So while visualized value does that, I think there's another layer of depth that can sit underneath that, which is really uh, trying to articulate all the nuance behind these ideas that have, that I can validate. So value is the intention of that is it to be a media brand that sits on top where um, the first iteration of it is kind of this web app that will be article based and categorized in these like big categories around you know, how to dial in your, your mindset to operate a certain way, how to think about your finances, how to uh, just, just tweak some of these fundamental belief systems that aren't serving you the way they should be. And uh, I've still got a lot to learn in that space too. And this is going to be a vehicle for sort of relaying that and bringing it to more people, not just the digital creator online income uh, community, which I love and have deep relationships in that world. But I have a, uh, it's a real challenge for me to think bigger than that and, and try to build something that sort of, you know, I could send it to um, anyone in my family and be like, have a read of this, see what you think. That's kind of the, the barometer for that. It's uh, I'm cognizant of the time. We have five minutes um, on the form event, uh, but I've just received several really good questions. If you, if we could bleed over, um, while while we um, while we take those questions, um, let me also just say for for everyone who is participating in in the audience, um, after the next couple of questions, I'm going to be describing our next event, which is September 28th, um, and we'll put up onto the screen um, your uh, the link for you to RSVP to that event. It's an event um, for creators hosted by Sahil. Um, online training for creators. So that event in September 20th. I just want to plug that. Um, uh, but let me uh, relay this question that we that we just received. Again, anonymous. Um, it's an excellent. On that, to owning a small percentage of a fast-growing startup where you work and you know on the order of uh, 0.5 to 1% of that startup. Um, Naval has a tweet inside the tweet storm that says that the only way to get wealthy is to own a percentage of a business. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's a great question. And I think if anybody could give a perfect answer to that, then they would never need to work because you'd be able to identify which startups are going to turn five. 0.5% or 1% of revenue into X amount of income that presumably would keep you and your family wealthy enough to not do anything ever again. But the idea, I think, I don't think they're mutually exclusive in some ways. So if you think about the um, experience that um, I talked about at the beginning of my career is essentially the same thing, but without the equity like i just i'll just advertising agencies don't give you equity in your um for the work you do generally speaking uh so this idea of like building this up almost as a if you're productizing knowledge you have to have a source for that knowledge so i don't think there's necessarily a mutually exclusive relationship there there's obviously people who can build things that are you know it, build one sell twice is like it's a big lofty idea like taylor swift is using the build one sell twice strategy right it's like this idea that you own an asset that you can give to spotify and they can stream it a billion times and you get paid five or 0.5 cents every time it plays it's just the idea of um having this revenue stream or this income stream tied to an asset that you don't have to physically if Taylor Swift had to go and drive to every house playing her songs and she got paid the same as she did from Spotify, then she would not be in the position she's in right now, right? So it's like this um, this paradigm, the comparison is interesting, but it's also 
probably a fast growing startup is going to be using the build one sell try strategy right that's how a SaaS company works that's how a um you know uh, a social platform works that's how like software companies have these enormous margins because they build something once and they can sell it to a thousand people with uh, um, marginal cost of replication. And your second question, this idea of owning, the only way to get wealthy is to own a percent of a business, visualize value as a business too. Right? You can build a business around a asset that you sell multiple times that you own a hundred percent or 50% of whatever else. I think it's a, it's a huge question to unpack, but, I would, um, I would say, you know, equity in that situation is better than no equity, but also the experience that you are gathering as a result of working in that environment is giving you the opportunity to produce assets that are exclusive to you over the long term. If that makes sense. Uh, why don't we field one more, Jack? Um, and let me compi compile. Um, three or so questions that are related to the one topic, which is discipline. There was a question we received around um, the idea of, you've been building visualized value for a year or so, um, and potentially longer. Have you noticed that your habits are different than your friends in the course of building that? Um, and um, so, I guess this question is driving as at the, the idea of what it takes. What does it take to do what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's just a classic skin in the game situation. I think, uh, my friends that own businesses and if they don't get up and do what they need to do, then they can't pay their bills. So their habits are very similar to mine. They wake up and do as much work as they need to do to keep the wheels on the business versus um you know if you exist in an environment or if you uh don't have to have that level of discipline to fulfill your obligations then you don't have it it's this um it's purely contingent i think on how you make your how you make ends meet it's like discipline is like the wrote something a while back. It's like, you don't need more discipline. You just need a better reason to be disciplined. So if you don't have that better reason, then it's very hard to drive at those behaviors. Um, and your friends that don't have to deploy discipline or deploy discipline differently because the situation they're in does not require discipline. It's the same idea as like procrastination. I thought of this idea the other day. So like you don't procrastinate in a situation where you're in danger, right? There's a tiger charging at you you get out of the way, right? You don't procrastinate. It's like, it's this thing that's driven by, it's always driven by a need or a, um, and, and this, uh, where am I gonna go with this? Like necessity is a mother of, of invention. It's like you put yourself in a situation where you, you either have to be disciplined. And I think a lot of that has to do with building in public and there's an upside and downside to this, right? You have now a reputation to upkeep and uphold, like taking a week off or, um, I'm not even taking a week off, but just uh, stop stopping doing what you're doing is violating the commitment you've made to the people that have bought your products. So that is another way to engineer discipline is make commitments to people and hold uphold those commitments. There's no like free lunch in that situation. It's uh, the more people you owe your service and your commitment to, the more disciplined you become. Uh, I'm going to leave with one question that I think is great and appropriate. Um, there was a question earlier about should you read broadly or read deeply, but the question that specifically I'd like to ask uh, was asked just now by, um, I think uh, his name is Luigi Rausch. Can you leave us with one book that has changed your life? Yeah, read uh, Psycho-Cybernetics, Maxwell Maltz. Thank you for that. Well, with that, um, I'd ask my colleague uh, to put up the, the um, after I start to thank Jack, um, the, the link to uh, the event in a few weeks. But 
On behalf of Sahil and Gumroad, Jack, thanks for being so generous with your time. And to everyone who has joined us today and is still here, thank you very much. Uh, really pleased uh, about this conversation with Jack and thanks for tuning in. Much appreciated. And thank we'll you, uh, put the link up uh, here for everybody to see. Thanks again, Jack. Yeah. Greatly appreciate thanks. it. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for spending your precious time. It's much appreciated. Cheers.